So today I picked a, a title and within this policy uh, context, I want to talk to you about uh, data science and is for resilient and healthy cities. It means I'm gonna talk to you about two cases of a study. One uh, that has to do with weather and infrastructure and the second one is in air quality. Then let's go to the first project and go with me to uh, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone uh, is a, in a particular uh, case that ranks between in 179 out of 188 in the Human uh, Development Index. It has to do that uh, it has a life expectancy of only 51 years old and an average schooling of only three years. And the city I'm gonna be uh, focusing on in, in the work is uh, Freetown that have uh, 1 million people out of the 7.8 million people in Sierra Leone. So the motivating uh, case study uh, was after the 2017 uh, landslide that produced uh, more than 1,000 people killed and the main uh, is a combination of uh, climate and uh, economic uh, situation. So basically it was rainfall floods and the situation in infrastructure is ineffective drainage, poor infrastructure in general, low evaluation, and a lot of deforestation. So in that context, I was invited uh, by a group in the World Bank and the title of projects they asked us was uh, mostly to try to understand the impact of the various natural hazards in the, in the ground to, uh, to use and motivate the development of open data sources and the idea uh, also to have a relationship with the government. And the type of question, the question they asked us is to inform infrastructure investments taking into account the other three items I mentioned to you. Then what we did there was uh, basically gathering different information on uh, the ge geological risk factors, hydrological risk factor, line line, and cost and line line. With that, we use it because it's not a, a particular uh, sophisticated machine learning process. It was the state of the art uh, conditions to estimate vulnerable uh, places in the region. And then we did this, uh, the hazard for river floating layer using standard techniques. Meaning that you are not meant to read this, but it's a whole uh, step-by-step -step data integration process. The keywords here is the US Army Corps of Engineering software. That's what we use. It was not our contribution. Our contribution come from the road network perspective. The innovation was using these estimates that comes uh, in general from environmental scientists with uh, the road network information. So basically what we did is uh, the interplay between the road network and the multi-hassle layer, pretty simple. And the first step and traditional step in terms of the road network is the between the centrality. We checked what are the, the number of streets that have more potential to have uh, people going through that, not based on demand, but based on the pure network topology. Then based on that, we could have the highest uh, places with highest impact, those are the ones that are more likely based on the hazard a layer and higher between the centrality. That was the first estimate. And second, of course, one thing is topologically, another thing is based on demand. And then for this purpose, we use one of the things that we always use in, the, in my group, that is mobile phone data converted into a transportation demand model just as a, a, a Snapshot here we have the trip production and the trip attraction with the different towers. It's relatively very few towers uh, in the place per capita. And here is where are the demand already routed in the open street map layer. Then the innovation comes when we put the different uh, places that are uh, 
we have, I mentioned the population road network, the road uh, street network, but another layer that we uh, incorporated was the facilities, critical facilities, such as schools, pharmacies, and hospitals. I mentioned it's about 1 million people. There are only 44 hospitals, 50 pharmacies. And that is the number of a school, 200 uh, high schools. When we have the flooding in the country, it's important to see when the access to these places are uh, closed. Then the second round of work we did in that is we created that what is called, in this case, the health uh, service centrality. This is a between the centrality that is weighted not only by the demand of the phone data, but also to the particular centers. Then in this case, we could do the before and after a scenario that is, if we have an event, a flooding of this river, for example, what are the, the health, the top 5% health of hospital facilities that may be accessing a way to access them? And then we could see per event, what is the service area that would suffer access to that uh, place and the ones that are gonna be attracting more. Then this was the type of things we do combining a uh, data science for resilience. And then next we propose community engagement to be prepared during the climate event and participatory urban design to be more prepared when the events comes. And second, uh, we would like to incorporate further the use of mobile phone data to act right after the event and analysis of images to better support the strategies. So the work is being uh, is available. The, the first part that was a simpler case and the second part with the serving centrality is just sent uh, for publication. Next, uh, well, this is uh, one aspect I, that I have hopes about the part of uh, Sierra Leone is the fact that the city is organizing these hackathons in which the people that uh, students and universities propose the use of technology for these solutions. Then I would like to bring these tools into these type of uh, venues. Then the next uh, story I want to tell you is called Deep Air. If you've seen the previous uh, work did not use uh, AI per se, it was basic new data sources and uh, bringing that to the infrastructure cases. In this case, it's the opposite case. We are uh, trying to use deep learning uh, technologies and satellite images into uh, the estimation of air quality. It comes motivated by a policy question as well. And uh, the idea is pretty dramatic. In certain places, here is uh, in Asia, in certain places, the, the level of PM2.5, that this particular matters, is of 25. And then here is that uh, the amount of uh, cigarettes, when you convert the PM2.5 of how many cigarettes you would uh, smoke per day if you are exposed to this. For example, the average in Beijing, just by being in the, in the street there, is like you smoked four cigarettes. And then it can be your kid, the elderly, people with illnesses because it's in the air. So the situation is pretty dramatic. And what brought me into the topic was how to measure these estimates combined with transportation uh, models to inform transportation policy. It became way more complex than that. And then today I'm not answering the policy uh, questions, but I would like to tell you how going deep into the prediction using the deep learning uh, techniques, what are the challenges we encounter to inform the policy interventions? So our project is called Deep Air and our idea was to use multi-scale images, computer vision, and that was the original goal. We are at these two layers at the moment, only in the prediction. Then the first thing, and uh, Lynn mentioned that uh, at the, in the opening, is that when you enter into a topic, there is the domain exp 
uh, expertise. And then the layers that matter and in the story that goes that you have a relative humidity planetary boundary layer. And then that affects the particle matters. That is what we try to predict. And uh, the secondary particle matter. So as it goes today, this uh, type of uh, observations, both of, on air quality and uh, climate, uh, weather, they are understood by what is called the conceptual models of atmospheric chemistry. Then we just wrote down what data we needed, and we are having a, you know, domain experts in our team, two of them, and also, of course, previous work trying to do the prediction exercise. We are focusing in California and the, what we predict, the concentration of PM2.5 come in hundreds of uh, monitoring stations. The current models to do that are linear regression models like this and have a typical R square of uh, not so good of, it goes from 32 to 66. And for example, this layer is the land use. They have a way to introduce land use and everything in only in a linear model. Of course, we thought it can be done better with a deep learning technologies. And what we do is a connection of convolutional neural networks to introduce all the data sets. This is a aerosol optical depth, the meteorological data, the map images, elevation, emissions, and a, some aspect of the basin and uh, the temporal component. We do that and also at the end uh, convert all this data into vectors and take the by LSTM to have uh, some learning about the periodicity on the data set. All that to predict one point. And the point is what is the concentration of PM 2.5 in space? Then, the, here are some aspects of the convolutional neural networks. We uh, generate 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers around the monitoring station. And one learning component we had into this is the land use sometimes have several uh, layers. What we learn on this, that what matters the most is just using Instead of using population, land use, closeness to a highway, and et cetera, like where uh, several variables in the previous practices, just gathering the Google image within the monitoring station would be way more useful than the other ways. One of the challenges is that the aerosol optical depth, that at the end is an indirect way to see how how uh, obscured is the air, has 95% uh, missing data. So basically, to really do the prediction model, we needed to correct the AOD. And that was one of the problems uh, we encountered. At the end of the day, we uh, needed to do the AOD correction, and we have a let's say a benchmark model that is the grading boosting machine, and we have the deep air model. At the end of the day, notice that the training, the R square in the training is fantastic. The R square in the testing, not so much. It's better than the uh, uh, benchmark case. However, it has uh, rooms for improvement. Right now, they are works of high resolution in uh, New York City with this R square. This is our uh, end goal. What I would like to mention is that even in the prediction exercise that is not easy, we are still are not having two components. Understanding how this uh, features importance for the prediction inform the atmospheric chemical models. And second, how this uh, features importance for the prediction informed policy. If you read carefully the, the, the factors that help you better to predict, not necessarily means some obvious cases like uh, trucks and policy. So that is where we stand in the topic. 
So one thing is the prediction exercise and the other is the actual application. But it's an interesting uh, aspect. Uh, so right now, the type of things we want to do, of course, improve our prediction and lately generate uncertainty of the prediction from the perspective of facility planning. That is the hot question we would like to answer. And second, we believe to go into this direction, aspect of causal inference would be interesting. And then doing high resolution uh, pollu pollutant exposure and beyond integrating mobility data. Those are the type of things uh, we would like uh, to be doing in this uh, arena. And with that, I would like to uh, leave some time for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Marta. Any questions? We have a lot of time for questions. Thanks for your talk. In the, in the first case study that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that you work with mobile phone data. How easy is that to get? How easy? Yeah. <laughs> it's not so easy. Yes, uh, that's a good question. In that case, Imagine that I myself, working with the bank, long ago I would have access to the data and proof that with that you could generate demand models that the people could use. Fast forward five years later, working still with the bank, another group of course, now I cannot get the data myself directly. So it was like a bit headache that that data is not available as easy. However, um, one can, basically, how it works is that you have somebody that have the data, you guide what to do with it and read the results. That is on the bad news with the mobile phone data that belongs to few companies that are the data providers. The good news is that now there are a companies called location-based service companies that basically they own apps. And as smartphones are really growing in penetration, you can do the demand models with these LBS companies. And those are way easier because, well, basically they are newer, they want to prove that they can be useful, and second, they simply sell the data. So it's like the money solution in that case. Thank you for the talk. So uh, my question was how exactly, as you mentioned, you deal with uncertainty, especially for deep learning, which is we don't really exactly know how to do. So yes. if you want to deal with uncertainty, do you want to try to do it using deep learning? And if yes, do you have a, like a, a way of doing that? Or you're thinking of using other methods that allow you to have a probabilistic understanding? Yes, that's a very... Good question. So, the, the way we want to, uh, basically more, the way we want to work with uncertainty is uh, just following the practice, people is just predicting the PM 2.5 in a given place, in a given day, or whatever the resolution is. We believe that we would like to go beyond the PM 2.5 alone and try to understand other time series and going back more into the conceptual models. So more than statistically uncertainty with deep learning, what we will, would like to... My challenge is that the community is doing the things one way and everything is about the prediction and that's it. And there are at least, I mentioned one paper, but we found in the last year at least five papers doing the same thing and everybody wants to predict only PM 2.5. I cannot enter the field and just criticize that way if I'm not doing as good as they are. So I want to improve a little bit how we're doing and then enter more into the creativity of, of the way. More than statistically speaking, I'm speaking towards the understanding of the interaction of the different components. Uh, for the road network analysis, my question is, do you use OpenStreetMap for the location of the roads? 
And as I understand it, uh, OSM roads are pretty good globally, um, but not fully complete. And their completeness is a little bit lower, probably in places in, in African um, environments. So does limitation on the completeness of your road network um, pose a challenge in the analysis? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, we use the OSM data that the bank, World Bank, had already cleaned up. If you see in uh, Sierra Leone in particular, they are the typical classification of OSM, but here we are putting in brown the unpaved. So a lot, the big majority of the ways in Freetown, not Sierra Leone, this is Freetown, in Freetown are unpaved. Then, Nowadays, when I started working with OSM, my engineers, transportation engineers colleagues would say, no, use NAFTEC, et cetera. Nowadays, they use OpenStreetMaps. So I believe that OpenStreetMap is the highest, uh, easier to update, update source. So I believe that definitely in the paved ways is no problem because there are very few. And we were taking care of the unpaved. One thing I want to mention is that for the facilities, we wanted to use a Google a API to download it. It was not possible. So it was much worse to gather the hospital, schools, and et cetera, and other point of interest. Then we needed to rely on the database of the city. So much more work to do on a point of interest than in the streets, I believe. I'm sorry if I didn't get it, but the, in the second part of the talk, like what were actually the highest predictors of PM 2.5 so far? Like, is it road networks or is it like yes. the topography? Like, do you have any intuitions already? Like, what, yes. what's really predicting here? Yes, we need to uh, work in presenting that part. So, <laughs> honestly, is the AOD is the highest predictor. But uh, if you think into a uh, environmental chemist, AOD is like you're predicting what you're measuring. So they are. So the OD is already measured and, uh, by the NASA, and the PM2.5 is in the monitoring station. So OD is the higher predictor. And also we were, yeah, the rest is similar proportion, I would say. We were very happy to discover this way, and we would like to explore further. The way the land use is introduced is several uh, variables like uh, transportation data, land use maps. And not only that, here is a monitoring station. They use different radios. So several variables with different radios. It gives you, for land use, 15 parameters in the sum of the linear uh, progression. We, for us, only introducing this image is working beautifully. And the reason we are not putting population because population is not helping into the prediction. So I would love to explore more of this, but it makes sense somehow. If you have a port, if you have a highway, it should affect the monitoring station measure. Yes. Population, yes, of course, of course. No, no, because uh, that's great. One thing is what we're doing, exposure at the end of the day has to do with what are the commuting patterns and where you live. Then at the beginning when I tried to do prediction, oh, the papers were absolutely rejected because I was too naive in the way I was approaching things. But the exposure, everybody accepted. You know, exposure is fine, it's not the problem. But then if we measure why and how much is produced, then we need to propose to do something about it. And the rest is because you are affecting this population. The second part is okay. So I'm not entering that into the prediction because we're gonna take care of that later, I think. With that, let's thank Marta again. Thank you.